we'll talk here about some of the benign tumors of the liver. And there's four that we're going to talk about, three which happen in adults and one which happens in the pediatric population, namely neonates and infants. So we'll talk about hepatic hemangioma, which is the number one, neoplasm of the liver, the most common, benign neoplasm of the liver, I should say. Uh, we'll talk about hepatocellular adenoma, focal nodular hyperplasia, and then the infantile hepatic hemangioendothelioma, which just like its name suggests, happens in infants, usually less than one month of age. Okay, so some of the rudimentary anatomy here, we've got, of course, the liver, the gallbladder, which sits up in the inferior aspect of the right lobe, uh, the spleen here, uh, the pancreas, which sits uh, posterior to the stomach, and then you get the duodenum here. All right, so uh, most people like to divide the liver up via the falciform ligament, which is this ligament that transverses the liver uh, right here. Uh, so in that case, we'd have the right lobe here and the left lobe. Now, some people like to divide the liver up into which uh, part of the liver gets circulation from the left hepatic artery and which part of the liver gets circulation from the right hepatic artery. So if you do it that way, then the left part of the liver would include the left lobe here and the left part of the right lobe. Um, and then the right part of the liver would include the, the further right part of the right lobe. So it doesn't really matter how you uh, want to define it, but for, uh, for our purposes, we're just going to define it uh, via the uh, falciform ligament. So right lobe, left lobe here. Uh, so the circulation to the liver, of course, we have the uh, hepatic artery, the common hepatic artery, which comes off of your celiac axis and that's going to divide off into the left and right hepatic arteries. You also get some uh, supply from the venous circulation, and that would be from the portal vein. And the portal vein is pretty much, for, our, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, made up of the inferior and superior mesenteric veins and the, uh, the uh, splenic vein. So they come together and form the uh, portal vein. The drainage from the liver comes from the uh, left and right hepatic veins, and they come together and then drain into the inferior vena cava. Now the biliary tract is uh, also important to discuss, uh, and the biliary tract drains bile, which ultimately will go into the duodenum. And so for that, you can't see all of it here, but you've got a left and right uh, hepatic duct. The left and right hepatic duct come together to form the common hepatic duct. The com common hepatic duct receives the cystic duct, which comes from the gallbladder. And when the cystic duct and common hepatic duct come together, it forms the common biliary duct. So that's different from the common hepatic duct. Common hepatic duct plus cystic duct equals common biliary duct. And then you also receive the pancreatic duct um, and after that, then you are now the ampulla of Vater. And so this is the ampulla of Vater here, and it drains into the duodenum, and the sphincter that controls that is the sphincter of Audi. All right, so there's some rudimentary anatomy. So the hepatic hemangioma is the first benign tumor we're going to talk about, and this is the most common benign tumor affecting the liver, and there's no malignant potential with the hepatic hemangioma. Um, that's going to be important because two of these tumors of the four that we're going to talk about do have, uh, do have malignant potential. Women are affected more often than men, and that's about a four to six to one ratio. The symptoms, uh, as you're going to see for pretty much all of these benign tumors, there's really no symptoms. They're discovered coincidentally uh, on imaging, usually CT or MRI, that's done for another reason. If they do produce symptoms, it's going to be either right upper quadrant pain or more often a fullness. It can rupture, however, it doesn't rupture quite as often as uh, the other one that we're gonna see, which is the hepatic uh, adenoma. Now, they do rupture when they get big enough, but usually when you discover these, they're not that big, but they can be quite large. Uh, so uh, they're, they're variable. 
Uh, when they do present ruptured, the symptoms that that's going to give is a sudden, severe, generalized abdominal pain, and then ultimately hemodynamic instability uh, because you're getting bleeding into the peritoneal space. For diagnosis, usually, like I said, this is going to be a coincidental diagnosis. Uh, but if you do have a patient who presents with right upper quadrant pain or fullness, the uh, obvious test to go to would be a right upper quadrant uh, ultrasound. One of the most common things that pro uh, cause right upper quadrant pain is, uh, is problems involving the gallbladder, cholelithiasis. Uh, and so that's what we're looking for first. And so we're usually doing a right upper quadrant uh, uh, sonogram. And so uh, you may see a mass in the liver when you do the right upper quadrant sonogram, and that would be what makes you suspicious for uh, a tumor, either benign or malignant. Now, if you do see a mass, uh, it can be useful to get a Doppler because with the hepatic hemangioma, what you're going to see are vessels within the mass. So that can be useful as well. Either way, if you have a mass, you should get a CT or an MRI. And when you've, once you've concluded that it's hepatic hemangioma, which it usually is if it's a patient with no cirrhosis, no real big risk factors for, uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the most common, uh, the most common malignancy, uh, then you can conclude that it's hepatic hemangioma and uh, you can leave it at that. Uh, this is not something that should be biopsied, unlike some of the other tumors which can be biopsied. This one really should not be biopsied because what do you have? You've got a very delicate uh, mass that's got blood, and you don't want to uh, mess around with that because it can rupture and then you can create a bigger problem than you had. So asymptomatic hemangiomas should be documented but left alone, and perhaps you may want to follow up and see if it's growing. Of course, if it's a ruptured hemangioma, then this needs to be treated first with hemodynamic stabilization, so getting uh, IV fluids into the patient, uh, cross-checking their blood type, and possibly providing them with red blood cells, and then that should be promptly followed by a surgical resection or arteri arterial embolization. All right, hepatocellular adenoma is a little bit less common, but this is a stereotypical one to come up on the USMLE. Now this particular benign tumor is strongly associated with the use of oral contraceptive pills. Uh, you may also see it in anabolic steroids and certain fertili fertility drugs, uh, and then also it can get worse during pregnancy. But far and away, the most stereotypic way to see this is in younger women that are taking oral contraceptive pills. So women are more effective than men, nine to one, just because oral contraceptive pills put you at risk for de developing hepatocellular adenoma and to rupture your hepatocellular adenoma. Um, but men can get it, uh, particularly if they're taking steroids. There is malignant potential when a patient has hepatocellular adenoma, so that's important to keep in mind. Symptoms, just like the hemangioma, it's really asymptomatic, uh, and if it's discovered, it's usually incidental, coincidental. Uh, when it does provide symptoms, usually it's going to be in the context of a rupture. However, you can get uh, some vague right upper quadrant pain or fullness uh, symptoms. Occasionally, it can present as a palpable abdominal mass, but for the purposes of the USMLE, this is usually going to present stereotypically as uh, a young woman who's on uh, birth control, and she presents with generalized abdominal pain, which came on suddenly with no context of trauma, and uh, she's got either a, a low hemoglobin on CBC or she's in shock. Uh, that's your stereotypical way for this to present both in real life and on a USMLE. Uh, now, the patient is in right, right upper quadrant pain or is even in uh, generalized abdominal pain. Uh, you may get sonogram. That can provide you with suspicion. Uh, besides biopsy, though, the most accurate diagnostic test is going to be MRI with gadolinium enhancement. Now, of course, if the patient does have a rupture, if they've got acute abdominal pain, generalized abdominal pain, and they're in shock, of course, you're not going to be getting uh, MRI. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind.
A workup may also include an alpha fetoprotein just because on sonography or even on uh, CT or MRI, it can be difficult to tell this from uh, the hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, most of what's going to help you uh, differentiate between hepatocellular adenoma and hepatocellular carcinoma is going to be the patient's history. These are usually in young women, whereas hepatocellular carcinoma are usually in older men, especially who have a history of alcoholism or a history of hepatitis. The treatment for hepatocellular adenoma, if it's asymptomatic, then it should be documented but left alone. Uh, but most importantly, the patient should discontinue any oral contraceptive pills because that puts her at risk for growth of the adenoma and ultimately rupture. If the patient is on any anabolic steroids, they should obviously be off of that too. Uh, and the woman should also avoid pregnancy because pregnancy puts you at risk uh, for rupturing your hepatocellular adenoma just because of the change in, in hormones. Uh, and I think what that has something to do with is uh, the fact that the liver detoxifies estrogen and it's uh, estrogen that uh, is monkeyed with, but I'm not exactly sure on that. Either way, uh, if the patient wants to get pregnant and she has a documented hepatocellular adenoma, then at that point you should do uh, elective resection because she should not get pregnant if she has a known hepatocellular adenoma. You should also do elective resection if it's particularly large. How large? You're not responsible for knowing on the USMLE. That's going to be uh, uh, at the discretion of the surgeon. Also important with hepatocellular adenoma, even if it's asymptomatic, you should monitor it with sonogram to see if it's growing. Uh, and then also an annual alpha fetoprotein because hepatocellular adenoma presents an increased risk for the de development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Patients with ruptured hepatocellular adenoma, just like the ruptured hemangioma, should be treated with hemodynamic stabilization followed by surgical resection. Focal nodular hyperplasia is the second most common benign tumor of the liver, and there is an association with oral contraceptive use, but not nearly as strong as what we see with hepatocellular adenoma. Uh, the symptoms for focal nodular hyperplasia, like all of these first three benign tumors are usually nothing, asymptomatic, uh, but we get suspicion when uh, we do sonography or any kind of imaging test and we see something, some kind of mass in the liver. Diagnosis, now this one, it's important to know a specific finding that you can see on CT. Um, diagnosis can usually be made on CT via this uh, characteristic central scar that occurs in 80% of focal nodular hyperplasias. Uh, if you don't have that central scar, then another test that you can do to differentiate this from uh, some of the other uh, masses, which uh, the hepatocellular adenoma, which is the number one benign tumor of the liver, and hepatocellular carcinoma, which is obviously a malignancy, uh, you can use this uh, sulfur colloid scan, technetium 99M. And what that does is, uh, so remember the technetium scan. We also do that for Meckel's diverticulum. You can also do it here for the liver. And what you're doing here is uh, this technetium is going into the liver, and it gets taken up by uh, these uh, cells in the liver called Kupfer cells. And Kupfer cells exist in focal nodular hyperplasia, but they don't exist in the other tumors. So if you have a patient with focal nodular hyperplasia, you'll see the, uh, the, the technetium taken up, and so you'll see a hot spot. Whereas if they have another kind of tumor, then uh, it's not focal nodular hyperplasia. I'll show you a picture of this in a little bit. Uh, rupture is non-existent in FNH, and there's no documented malignant potential, so there's really nothing uh, to do about focal nodular hyperplasia other than make sure it's focal nodular hyperplasia and, uh, and um, not something else. Uh, you should, uh, you don't need to, there's debate on whether, because it is associated with oral contraceptive pills, on whether uh, a woman should discontinue oral contraceptive pills. Um, that's questionable, so I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that you have to remember that for the USMLE, because there's debate on that. Uh, but there should be uh, some routine monitoring with sonography to make sure that this isn't getting any bigger. Okay, so this is a CT of a typical focal nodular hyperplasia lesion. Uh, 
and this is the central scar. So we have the, the mass here, and then the central scar in the middle, which is uh, hypoechogenic. Uh, and here's another one. And so you should be doing this CT with contrast. Okay, and this is a technetium scan. So uh, if you're unsure, like say for instance, you don't see the central scar and you're, you don't know if this is necessarily an FNH, uh, then what you should do is get this technetium scan. And what this technetium scan will do uh, is if you do have FNH, because uh, FNH does have those Kupfer cells in it, like normal liver tissue, it should uh, light up. And so here you have uh, this darkness, which is absorb, uh, absorbing technetium. Uh, and so you see it early on here, and then later on you see these uh, hot spots. Whereas if it's not an FNH, you'll see a cold spot in the place of where the uh, uh, in the place of where the, the uh, tumor is. So you'll have to you'll have to compare that to where you see the mass and then whether that mass corresponds to a hot spot, in which case it would be focal nodular hyperplasia, or whether it corresponds to a cold spot, in which case it we know it's not focal nodular hyperplasia. We don't know what it is, but we know it's not FNH. Okay, infantile hepatic hemangioendothelioma, IHH. This is a benign tumor that happens in young children, in, uh, I should say just in infants and neonates, first month of life. Uh, and this is the most common benign tumor, uh, I should say most common benign hepatic tumor in pediatrics. It's still rare overall though. It's, this does have malignant potential and so that's important to remember. Uh, usually this presents in uh, very early infancy, and it's going to be important to differentiate this from hepatoblastoma. Now, one of the things that's going to help you with that is a very characteristic symptom of IHH, and that's high output cardiac failure. What you've got here is you've got a bunch of vessels, and so it reduces uh, the systemic vascular resistance that the heart is pumping against, and so the heart is, uh, is going to be pumping more. And the result of that is that you're going to get uh, high output cardiac failure. And so that's going to cause uh, respiratory distress, uh, edema, and so forth. Uh, all other things that you'll see, of course, because it's a mass and because babies, newborns are small, you'll be able to easily feel the mass, uh, usually as a palpable abdominal mass, otherwise as hepatomegaly. Uh, you may see it as abdominal distension. And then uh, you can also get uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia. And the thrombocytopenia is because this tumor, uh, because it's vascular, can uh, sequester platelets, and that's called Kasselbach merritt syndrome, and that's something that you can see with IHH. So if you have a young child with an abdominal mass and respiratory distress, you should definitely be thinking of IHH. For diagnosis, uh, you can either do sonography, which you'd probably do if they just had an abdominal mass but maybe no respiratory distress, but uh, the best way to diagnose this is uh, via CT with contrast. What we also though need to do is differentiate this from, uh, from hepatoblastoma. And so the best way to do that is uh, via an alpha fetoprotein. If the alpha fetoprotein is normal, then that's very reassuring. That's not consistent with hepatoblastoma. If the alpha fetoprotein is very high, then you may want to get a biopsy. The treatment for IHH, despite this really disastrous way it presents is actually conservative management and the reason is because this tumor spontaneously regresses by the time the baby hits about 12 months of age and so surgery is really reserved for refractory cases so for the respiratory distress usually it'll respond to diuretics and digoxin if there's any kind of anemia or thrombocytopenia you can administer blood products uh, and then uh, to speed regression you can give corticosteroids or interferon alpha 2a Usually these kids are sick, they need to be in the hospital, but uh, most of these kids come out fine. Now, there is a risk for a malignant degeneration, and that would be angiosarcoma, which we're not going to talk about here because that's a malignant tumor, uh, but usually if that happens, it'll happen by around age three. 
So just to recap, we have the hepatic hemangioma, which is the most common uh, benign tumor of the liver, and that uh, will present either asymptomatically or uh, with right upper quadrant fullness or pain, or it can present with sudden abdominal pain and shock, which would be a rupture. Way to diagnose this is, uh, best way to diagnose it would be MRI with gadolinium enhancement. You can also use CT. Asymptomatic, you just monitor it. Uh, if it's symptomatic, you can do an elective removal. If uh, it ruptures, obviously you need to resuscitate the patient and remove it as quickly as you can. Hepatocellular adenoma, most notably, has an association with oral contraceptive use as well as steroids and uh, some of the uh, uh, some, some of the drugs that are used for fertility. Uh, I should say anabolic steroids, not corticosteroids. Uh, this is usually also asymptomatic until it ruptures, uh, but if there are symptoms in between then, it would be right upper quadrant fullness, pain, or a palpable mass. The way to diagnose this also uh, is going to be MRI. That would be the most accurate test outside of biopsy, uh, but usually CT is enough. These patients, if they're asymptomatic, they should just be monitored. However, they should also discontinue their oral contraceptives or anabolic steroids or whatever they're on. Uh, and they should also have uh, a serial alpha fetoprotein done uh, every year. If they're symptomatic, you can do an elective removal. I don't believe, though, that that's going to get them out of needing to get the uh, annual alpha fetoproteins done. If it ruptures, then, of course, same thing. You're going to resuscitate the patient and do an emergent resection. Focal nodular hyperplasia, we will do uh, a uh, sulfur colloid scan. That's the technetium 99. It's also known as sulfur colloid scan. Uh, these patients, again, are going to present usually asymptomatically. But they can present with right upper quadrant fullness, pain, or mass. These patients generally just need to be monitored. And then the infantile hepatic hemangioendothelioma usually uh, is in very, very young babies. Uh, poor feeding, abdominal mass, respiratory distress, uh, and then anemia, thrombocytopenia are the symptoms that come with this. And for diagnosis, uh, you can do a CT or MRI. Uh, I should say CT with contrast or MRI. Uh, and then uh, you should also get alpha feta protein levels uh, just to distinguish this from uh, it, from hepatoblastoma. Biopsy can be done also if needed. And then this is supportive treatment with diuretics and digoxin, prednisone, interferon, and blood products if needed. Surgery is reserved for severe cases. And if you have any questions, let me know.